The following podcast is a member of the Pokecasters Network. Pokecasters Network, supporting Pokemon content creators, their shows, and the community of Pokemon fans. To find out more, check out pokecastersnetwork.com or find us on Twitter and Facebook. Hello, and welcome to Lucas Lectures, hosted by the big fish himself, veteran Lucas. Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's topic. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Lucas Lectures. My name is Lucas. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day or night. Now, today we are going to be talking a little bit about Pokemon Evolution. Specifically, we're going to be talking about one of the, let's say, weirder aspects of the Pokemon world. I know there's plenty of weird stuff, everything from living apple pie dragons to Ash never growing up to all the nurse joys looking the same, either being clones or some ridiculous nonsensical triplet, quadruplet, octiplet nonsense. We're going to be talking about the evolutionary stones. Uh, the evolutionary stones have been around in the game since the very beginning, with Pokemon like Arcanine, Ninetales, Staryu. They've all had a chance to evolve by being given a certain stone. Uh, now, in the beginning, it was just three stones. You had your Water Stone, you had your Fire Stone, you had your Thunder Stone. Sorry, there was a fourth, the Moon Stone. It's a weird stone, and we'll get to that. But nowadays, we have a lot of stones. We have Dawn Stone and Dusk Stone. The Ice Stone was just added. We have Shiny Stones, the Sun Stone. We have a lot of different stones that are used in the game, but they all work the same. Throw it on the Pokemon, they'll get to evolve. No leveling up required. Each one of these stones has this ability to kickstart a Pokemon's evolution and change it into something completely different and usually a lot stronger. Uh, this is... Again, not the strangest way for a Pokemon to evolve. That goes to Inky, and that's, to me, not only strange, but a really stupid game mechanic that if you didn't have the internet, you would never figure out. Like, oh, this is my Inky. I've leveled it up to 100. Why hasn't it evolved? I don't understand. Oh, dude, just turn your game console upside down. What? That's it. That's all you got to do. It's really, really dumb. I think it's dumb. Anyway. Uh, this episode, we are going to discuss the stones and see what effects they actually have on the Pokemon, what we have on Earth that compares to the stones, and then we'll wrap up with trying to explain some of the science that goes into it from the Pokemon world's perspective. So without further ado, let's get into the stones themselves. Now, all change in an organism requires energy. Uh, plants get their energy from the sunlight. The sunlight is converted into sugar through photosynthesis, and it fuels cell division, which allows the animal to grow. In humans, same thing, only remove sunlight and replace it with pizza roll and Red Bull. The same has to hold true for Pokemon evolution. In the case of the stone, they seem to give off a specific amount and type of energy to trigger the change in the organism's growth. A stone can affect many Pokemon, but each one has a different effect depending on who it's used on and what stone you're using. A really good example of this is Staryu and Shelder. Staryu Give it a water stone, it's going to get a lot faster and its special attack is going to go higher. Give that to a cloister, the cloister isn't going to get a higher special attack or speed, it's going to get much more focused on defense and attack. So it's not that the stones have a very specific effect on any Pokemon, it's just that stone triggers a change in that evolution. For cloisters, I think it's really interesting because you're not so much getting bigger in that sense, you, you are getting larger, but you're simply building up more calcium around your body to protect yourself to become that much stronger Pokemon. Uh, we also can use uh, Starmie as a really good example, because since Starmie is supposedly from another planet, that shows that the stones can probably be found on other planets as well. So it's not just an Earth-bound mineral. It's something very similar to iron or gold in that it can be found in other places as well. Thunderstones seem to just work like natural batteries. My guess is if you plugged up a Pokemon to a power plant, that electricity alone would cause it to change. It seems to just be a specific amount of electricity put into a small object, and once that battery of sorts is just given to a Pokemon, it absorbs it all. A Vicavolt helps prove that thought, because Vicavolt back in Alola used to have to walk all the way up a mountain. You had to get to this one specific spot when your little Chargabug was way over leveled and then get to evolve him. But now, just give him a Thunderstone. He'll be fine. And it's basically the same thing. You have to get a certain amount of energy to get it to change. Uh, the Sunstone is just a solar battery. It has the ability to give plant Pokemon an ability to kind of get an upgrade. 
Uh, what's really weird is that it also seems to clean away impurities like with gloom. When you give it to gloom, it completely loses its poison typing. Uh, to me, though, weirdest stone has to go to the Moonstone. The Moonstone has some really random Pokemon that it affects. So it's supposed to give off lunar radiation, whatever that means. Um, and it's going to be affecting things like Skitties and Nidorinos and Clefairies. And to be perfectly honest, there's very little thread connecting any of these three Pokemon. Uh, you could make the case for Nidorino and Nidorina because they are rabbits and there's a lot of mythology based on rabbits on the move. God, I sound like Collins when I say that, but it's true. There is a lot of mythology putting to rabbits on the moon. And there's also a lot of things with the game with Clefairy being from the moon. For Skitty, I don't know. It's a cat. Cats like night. I get whatever. Uh, the Leaf Stone kind of works similar to the Sunstone, only instead of seeming to be filled with solar energy, it seems to be filled with chlorophyll. It seems to give the plant life a boost, a growth, if you will, the ability to produce more energy and create more sugar. Uh, the Dusk Stone is just evil. That's it. It just seems like, here, would you like to embrace the dark side? We have a rock for that. Uh, the other thing I noticed while doing this list is that the Sunstone was already out and made in Gen 2. But then, for some reason, Pokemon decided to make the brilliant decision to add a Dawn Stone and a Shiny Stone. Each one of them represent a different kind of light. And I don't really feel that's needed. Uh, at least lose the Dawn Stone. You don't need it. Just change it up with the Shiny Stone. The Shiny can at least be called, like, the opposite of the Dusk Stone and that it holds good. I get the Dawn and Dusk thing kind of works out, but, I mean, we already have the Sun Stone. I'm sorry to rant out again, but we already have it. Why do we have so many Shiny Rocks? So, how would you compare the Pokemon Evolutionary Stones to anything in our world? In our world, we have two forms of change that occur that are pretty close to Pokemon evolution. Again, when you say Pokemon evolution, it's not actually evolution. It's similar to something called metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is similar to what you see with insect, and where you see them go from caterpillar to cocoon to butterfly. Uh, for a metamorphosis to occur in our world, it takes a lot of time. In the Pokemon world, it doesn't. However, one thing that is in common is energy. A Pokemon has to either level up or eat it, or an animal has to eat a ton of food in order to get the energy to change into its new form. The other word, which is the one we're going to focus on more, is the word mutation. That word is known a lot now thanks to popular culture and comic books and anime and all kinds of media, but people don't realize just how important mutation is. When it comes to a natural evolution, the evolution of our world, Natural selection and mutation are two very different, but equally large players in that game. An organism's genetics uh, can pick up a glitch over time. Let's say the DNA breaks and repairs itself in a different way. And this can cause the cells to do all kinds of different stuff. Uh, the organism cells, even specific chromosomes, the species, even the gender, even the sexual biology of that organism can determine the different rate of mutation. And these can, mutations can be unnoticeable. You could not have any outward effects or internal effects. They can be beneficial, which is a little bit rare, or more likely, um, some of them can actually cause some harm. Uh, the most common harm that we know of in our lives with these mutations is something like cancer. Beneficial mutations, while those things aren't as common, they are a huge role in how an animal survives. For example, you probably heard the news about the new COVID strain that it started uh, showing up in the UK. Uh, that is a result of mutation, where the virus, where it was assembling itself, it mutated in one of the cells and it created a new strain. That can happen with large organisms as well. Uh, in snakes, one of the popular thoughts on how snake venom occurred was there was a mutation that allowed for it to generate certain cells in different parts of the body causing it to have a different effect to form the venom glands that you see in vipers and other kinds of venomous snakes. So these were not things that evolved naturally through natural selection of an animal getting stronger. These were things that just happened over time. So let's be honest with ourselves. When we think of uh, mutation, we think of the Incredible Hulk, or we think of the X-Men, or we think of any sort of thing that was affected by radioactive energy of some variety. Uh, radioactivity is a scary word to a lot of people, 
But just so you guys know, it's not as scary when you learn a little bit about it. It's still something you should notice, though. So, radioactivity is an attribute of minerals that contain radioactive elements. So there are a lot of radioactive elements you guys don't think of. Obviously, there's things like uranium and plutonium. But did you know potassium is also radioactive? If you eat a certain number of bananas, I think it's somewhere around like tens to several hundred thousand bananas, the radiation will be what kills you. Not the dying from large amounts of bananas, but the radiation will get you. Uh, so radioactive elements are going to be radioactive because they can contain disintegrating nuclei in the atom. So this is going to emit alpha, beta, and gamma rays as it is slowly decaying. Now uranium is constantly in that state of decay, so it's giving off those rays, which can cause, shall we say, adverse effects to living organisms. So an outside force can definitely trigger mutation. Things like radiation can do it, but also different forms of food and chemicals can have its effect on your DNA. Uh, the typical cause of mutation being, of course, when your DNA breaks and tries to repair itself, it repairs in a different way, causing a glitch. And that glitch isn't usually beneficial, but it isn't always negative either. Now, there are different isotopes and compounds that are made with uranium, and this can be the stuff that's pretty dangerous. You have to work very, very carefully to avoid contamination. Uh, which is really bad because in the old days, people would just carry this stuff around in their pockets and wonder why they were getting sick over time. So you can have a stone affect your biology, but it's not very quick. It is going to take time to affect you unless it's something that blew off the chunk of Chernobyl, in which case you're going to start noticing some pretty nasty stuff. Now, there is a third option. Instead of just mutation, instead of just um, going through a quick metamorphosis, what can also be happening is that the energy of the stones in our in the Pokemon world can be very similar to something called serotonin or serotony. I can't pronounce that word. It's your new word of the day, S-E-R-O-T-I-N-Y. So serotony is mainly found in plants, and it's a really cool behavior where an outside force will trigger a change in the organism's development. Uh, the most famous version of this that we see in the United States is going to be wildfires. So wildfires in the United States can actually create a situation where plants start to bloom and start to release their seeds. It's a naturally evolved adaptation that allows an organism to pick the exact right time it needs in order to produce its seeds. So it's just waiting for any sort of outside stimulus to give it the cue to grow and get stronger. Not as exotic as a rock making you mutate different limbs, but it's still a really cool behavior. So. Let's put a bow on this whole thing and see how the stones might work in the Pokemon world. So evolving is pretty common in the Pokemon world. Just about every Pokemon can do it, and the ones that can't, I really feel bad for. But where most Pokemon seem to get their energy over time, i.e. leveling, when you're leveling up, they're just gaining more energy to evolve, the ones that need the stones either require a certain amount of energy all at once, or the stones trigger a response on a cellular level. So the first theory, uh, that would mean that the stones give off a specific energy, a specific radiation that affects some Pokemon by triggering it, by giving it uh, that quick mutation. Uh, the radiation causes a series of those rapid mutations, and in a short amount of time, you get yourself a new Pokemon. Uh, for this theory to pan out, though, that would mean that if you were to give, let's say, a Thunderstone to a Pikachu, it turns into a Raichu. What would happen if you put a Thunderstone next to a Rattata? Would that emitted radiation affect them? Would it have no effect? Would it cause weird mutations in those living organisms? Uh, or, funner fact, what if you thought about how many Thunderstones you give them? What if you gave multiple Thunderstones to a Pikachu? Would that become a supersized Raichu? Would that cause horrific mutations and growing extra long tails or their body getting too chunky? What would happen if you expose these organisms to more than one stone or expose them to the Pokemon who has no reason to be near it? That would be a fantastic thing to study and probably what I would do in the Pokemon world the second I get there. Most of you would go out and start your adventures. I would just start collecting stones and start putting them next to different Pokemon and recording the results. Is it ethical? No, but neither is most of anything in the Pokemon world. For my second theory, instead of mutating due to the radiation, what's actually happening is the organism's body is reacting to that energy as a signal similar to the plants in the wildfire. 
by reacting to it, they either are going to protect themselves from that radiation by evolving to a type that can absorb it, or it's seeing that as when the stone is available, that is going to be the perfect time to evolve. So instead of mutating, the cells have that naturally evolved over time reaction. So this would have been something that's done through natural selection. If there was, let's say, two Eevees, one Eevee that stayed away from the water, and one that started going near it, they would probably come in contact with more of these water stones. The ones that were able to adapt to that increased water stone radiation were the ones who were able to survive and become Vaporeon. Then again, Eevees are a cluster of horrible genetic information. I swear, if you don't evolve your Eevee, you are a monster. But they could have reacted differently depending on what stone they're surrounded by, what their body needs to adapt to. Uh, this body could be responding, again, as a defense. The radiation could be harmful from these stones if you stay too close to them. So what better way to defend yourself from it over time than to literally evolve it to make you stronger? I mean, think about it from a wildfire and plant perspective. Normally, a plant should not exactly enjoy going near fire if it can enjoy it. But being especially evolved and adapted to deal with that fire, that makes you a king. That makes you great at dealing with a problem that most things would consider a nightmare end-all scenario. So to really just start wrapping this up, I think the Pokemon stones are weird, but they're not the weirdest thing in the Pokemon world. I think the weirdest evolution to me next to flipping your Switch or DS upside down is giving your Pokemon a tooth and then trading it and then having it grow from there. There's some emotional psychology I am not qualified to deal with. I am literally rubbing my temples when I say that. Uh, keep in mind also, if you were in the Pokemon world and you found these stones, I would not keep them in your pocket. I would keep them in a lead-lined bag, inside a lead-lined bag, inside my backpack. They are giving off an energy that we know nothing about, and for some reason, it made my cute little Growlithe into a monster-sized dog I can ride. Now, in our world, when you hear the phrase radiation, don't freak out immediately. There are plenty of things that are radioactive in our world. You even consume minute amounts of uranium every day, typically from root vegetables. It's okay. Just as much as they have been used for bombs and to create the Incredible Hulk, uh, they are used in power plants. They are used in medicine. If you think about it, chemotherapy and x-rays are both types of radiation, and while they can be traumatizing in this form of chemotherapy, they've saved more lives than radiation has killed. It's a scary piece of science, but one that can help change lives, literally helping to get people into a proper healthy state. Now, if you want to learn more about radiation, there's plenty of government websites that can tell you about it. If you have a stance on not using nuclear power, that, that's not what this is about. The evolutionary stones are weird. I wanted to just see how weird they are compared to our world. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little trek down this glowing green road. If you guys have any other questions, comments, and concerns, we're always on Facebook or Twitter. I'm trying to be better on Discord. We had some issues with the Discord link not working. It kind of expires because that's, that's really annoying. We'll try and get one up with this episode. So hopefully we'll let you guys know when that's up again. Again, Twitter and Facebook are the best way to reach us. You can always find us on an email. Thank you guys so much. Again, First episode of the year, soon to be many more. We have so much planned for you guys this year. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Peace.